recording as well. Thank you. Okay, let's try that again. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for taking some time out of your week to join us this evening. Uh, my name is Jim Middaw and I am fortunate to be the executive director of the Multnomah County Drainage District number one, MCDD. MCDD is one of four agencies responsible for operating and maintaining the 27 mile levy and conveyance system that runs along the Columbia River here in greater Portland. I'm also fortunate to uh, be serving as the director of the new urban flood safety and water quality district that uh, the legacy districts and staff are working to set up today. Um, before we get started tonight, I wanted to start with our, just a little bit of recognition for the significant contribution of your volunteer board members who provide the day-to-day -day oversight uh, for the district. Uh, these folks put in a lot of time and energy and really help the staff and the community make sure that this system is operating well. And um, they're really awesome people. And uh, I just want to recognize them. They are uh, Ken Anderton and Nikki Schultz and Corky Collier, Kenzie Berry and Darian Santner. And I'm not sure you can see them, uh, but you should definitely thank them because they put in a lot of time helping make sure the system works well and that you're well represented uh, as we make decisions about our work. Uh, so thank you, board members. Appreciate you very much. Um, next, I, I want to, in, in times that are challenging, like we're living through right now, I think it's good to pause occasionally and think about some of the good fortune that our community also has. And one of the things that we're really fortunate about in our community is that uh, the work we're doing today is really a once in a lifetime chance to make government work better and make people safer from flooding in the process. And as you're gonna hear more about tonight from some of the other staff members, we're in the midst of transforming and streamlining the governance of our flood safety system and the infrastructure that makes it work. And we're also working to make it more representative, more efficient, more transparent, and more equitable. And importantly for folks who live or work or own businesses here on the floodplain, we're also working really hard to ensure that everyone who benefits from the flood safety system, not just those who live or work on the floodplain, are contributing to the investments that we need to make to upgrade and improve our 100 year old system. And we're making good progress on that. And finally, we're really becoming quite competitive in winning federal investments in our system that helps offset our local costs. We've seen some initial federal investments and authorizations that allow the federal government to take a big role in helping us pay for the upgrades and improvements we need. And we're poised to receive as much as $140 million from our federal partners, thanks to the great work of our boards and our staff and the community partners who are supporting our effort. And then last, before I turn it over to the other speakers tonight, um, I just wanna say welcome and thank you so much for being here tonight. Your presence really is important, really helps us make good decisions. And so we look forward to sharing some important updates and information with you and hanging around to answer your questions afterwards. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Janet Olson, who is the district's finance manager. Janet? I'm actually, um, sorry about that, Jim. I misspoke earlier. So I'm actually okay. gonna say a few things. Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah, More information so first. <laughs> Hi again. So I'm Wendy Lynn. I'm the board coordinator for the five districts. And is uh, everyone seeing that agenda? Uh, we'll just take a minute. So we're gonna just uh, make, clear that everyone uh, knows how to use the Zoom instructions. So we will um, also have two votes today, one on last year's meeting minutes, and then we do have uh, one board election for uh, two positions. And then you'll hear staff presentations. And um, we're going to ask you during those um, presentations to type your questions into the chat. If you have um, uh, questions about specific pieces of that, uh, their presentations, and then we'll also have a Q&A period at the end. So lots of opportunities to get those questions ans uh, answered. So, um, so you should, if you go to the bottom of your screen and hover those controls, you should see a, a chat option. So, um, if you type your questions in there, let me know if you have any problems with that. So we'll try and answer pertinent questions as we go along and then um, save uh, other questions for the end. Let's see, and then I do have everybody muted right now. I asked you just while the presenters are speaking to um, 
keep yourself on mute. And then there is an option under, um, let's see, what is it called for um, to raise your hand if you have a question. And we'll do that during the Q&A section at the end. So um, I would like to officially call this MCDD 2023 landowner meeting uh, to order. And I believe, Emily, you told us that we have a quorum. Can you tell us our the acres? Yes. So currently represented here, we have 4,287 out of um, 8,541. So we have enough uh, to have a quorum and run a complete meeting. Super. So yeah, the state statute requires us to have 50% of the acres represented in order to have any votes. So that's great, we did it. So the first thing on the agenda is uh, the minutes, are the minutes from last year, and you should have received those in your uh, packet that I emailed to you. And so I'd uh, love to have a, a motion to approve those minutes. I'll move that we approve the 2022 meeting minutes. Is there a second? I'll I'm sorry, who was that? That was Ken. Ken, thank you so much. So um, let's see, we'll do a vo voice vote for those minutes. So feel free to take yourself off mute. And um, all those in favor of approving, or is there any discussion or corrections that anyone has? If not, we'll uh, call for a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I just Thank voted. You. Thank you. Are there any opposed? Okay, oh, thank you. Unmuted. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to mute everybody again. And so, um, uh, Jim introduced the MCDD board. We have five board members. Um, we have Corky Collier and Corky, do you want to say hi? <laughs> oh, he's not. He's on mute. Of course I would make that mistake. <laughs> hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And then Kenzie Berry, would you like to introduce yourself? Say who you represent. Sure. Hi, everyone. Privileged to serve you. And Kenzie represents Portland General Electric on the board. And uh, Nikki Schultz. Hello. I'm a private landowner. Great. Thank you. And then we have two additional board members. Uh, Ken Anderton, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, pleasure to serve you. I, I work for the Port of Portland. And Darian Santner. I am Darian. I represent City of Portland. Also honored to serve. Great, and thank you both. So um, the uh, quirky way that these elections work is it's by term. So we have um, uh, two seats whose terms are up right now, and uh, so we. Uh, the way the elections work is that the top two vote getters will um, fill those two seats. And so what we'll do, the, how the process goes is I'll open the floor for nominations and any landowner is uh, qualified to serve on the board. And then um, we will uh, go from there for the vote on this, um, these two seats with terms ending in 2026. Are there any questions about the process? It is a little bit confusing. If there aren't any questions, I would open the floor for nominations. I move that uh, we get Ken Anderson on there and that we get Darian Santner on there. Great. Is there a second for that? I'll be happy to second that. Thanks, Corky. 
And are there any other landowners um, or people interested in nominating land, other landowners for the board? I move we close nominations. Hearing no other nominations, we can we can close it. Just want to give it, everyone a chance to speak up. And um, so, since there are only two um, nominations and there are um, two seats open on the board, we can forego electronic voting and do a voice vote if uh, folks are amenable to that. I have what might be just an obvious question. Um, is it basically that we're that the incumbents are being nominated again? Is that is that what's happening here? That's what happened. And if there's anyone else that would like to be nominated or you'd like to nominate another landowner, that is welcome right now. Did that answer your question? Great. Okay, is there anyone opposed to doing a voice vote? Otherwise, um, we can move forward. So all in favor of um, uh, electing Ken Anderton and Darren Santner to the board, say aye. 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 Are, there any, are there any opposed? Well, congratulations and thank you to everyone. Three more, three more years. <laughs> so that concludes the that business portion of the meeting and the next section are staff presentations. And our first is the financial update from our finance manager, <laughs> Janet Olson. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to the, the next year. <laughs> um, can you go to the next slide, please, Wendy? Thank you. Um, this is just to let everyone know that the 2021-2022 financial audit was completed on time. Uh, we did use the accrual method, James Marta and Company, which has been our auditor for the last five to six years. They completed the audit for us. Uh, the district received a clean financial audit free of any material misstatements, which is very good. Um, it's exactly what you want to have. And if anyone would like to obtain a copy of the district's audited financial report, you can either go out to our website um, in the library for documents. It would be there. Or also you can get a hold of myself at the district, and I'll be happy to send a copy to you. So that's about it. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, Janet. You're welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Owen. I'm the Director of Engineering and Operations at the district and serve as the Chief Engineer um, for the district as well. Uh, I'm going to run through a couple of slides here to give you an idea of what the district does, particularly for those who may be new. Um, to these meetings or new to the area, um, but I'll also um, comment on some activities that we have done as staff over this last year um, with the board's approval and um, give you a glimpse of what we'll be doing uh, over the next 12 months or so. So next slide, please. So what does the Multnomah County Drainage District do? Why do we exist? So we are part of four special districts in the North Portland metro area. Uh, MCDD uh, is the largest of the four located uh, in the middle there. And um, we honestly, we have pretty straightforward responsibilities currently. One is to provide uh, flood protection through levy maintenance. Um, and levee management, and those levees um, separate out the Columbia River uh, from its main channel 
uh, from the um, from the the uh, historical floodplain. Levees do go all the way around uh, and also protect the um, the district from the Columbia Slough from rising as well um, in in the uh, far west end of the of the district. In addition to flood protection, we provide conveyance of water. Uh, within the managed floodplain, uh, and we do so by making sure that water can move from point A to B in the open channels for the most part. Um, but at the end of those channels are is a levee, and so we have to make sure that we can um, use our pump stations are operating properly in order to pump that water up and over the levee system. To do so um, and uh, to make sure that we provide services in all situations, uh, we um, routinely um, exercise and prepare for emergency uh, responses. Uh, and uh, so we are active uh, in a national system of how to respond similar to FEMA or other federal organizations as well as the county. Uh, and finally, we support, um, we uh, engage with uh, partnerships with other uh, regional agencies uh, when uh, the common uh, when there are common goals for each, uh, and that occurs on several cases. That may be other cities, uh, some nonprofits, uh, the port and uh, county, and so forth. So um, partnerships are a big part of what we do. So how does the system work? Um, there are two types of risk, uh, flood risk that we try to manage. Uh, one is on the Columbia Riverside and one is internal to the drain, to the uh, to this managed floodplain area. Uh, from the Columbia River, of course, uh, the water comes down from um, the ba the larger basin you know, from Montana and Canada all the way down here. So Snow melts and rainfall contribute water uh, to the Columbia River and goes through the series of dams many of you are familiar with. Um, but when it comes down to this part of the of the basin, the levee system um, separates the water in the main channel from entering into the managed floodplain. Um, and so we make sure the levees are maintained and are functioning as designed. On the inward side of the levee system, um, as I was referencing earlier, um, there's a series of open channels, dra um, sloughs, drainage ditches, uh, and, and the like that uh, allow water to flow down to our stormwater pump stations, which then, then gets pumped, which then, sorry, pumps the water up and over the levee system. Um, if, if you can, if you want to envision it, the MCD is a, one giant bathtub, and those stormwater pump stations are the only way that water within the managed floodplain, as well as um, lands south of us uh, up to the Alameda Ridge and so um, ridge line um, outside the district, uh, water can uh, water any type of rainfall runoff from there. Uh, has to come, get pumped up and over the system. So next slide, please. So why do we exist? In 1917, um, uh, uh, agricultural interests and farmers at the time um, formed the district through the state of Oregon's process, but we're a lot different than uh, what uh, the land here was like in 1917. Um, you can see from these statistics, there are several, there are many, many people that live here a lot more who uh, have jobs here. So we're a regional um, uh, 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 center for um, manufacturing and all, all sorts of types of uh, jobs in, in, the, in our area. Um, and uh, it's also, of course, the um, location or the regional airport is located at PDX, as well as the city of Portland's uh, secondary uh, drinking water system, the groundwater system, all their wells are in, within the, the managed floodplain up here. Um, and you can see some other um, uh, features of, of the things that we protect as part of our system. Next slide, please. So what's been happening over the last 12 months or so? Um, so let me give you an update of that. Um, the uh, board approved um, through their budget process that 
Um, we can begin the replacement of one of our trash rake systems at pump station four. This is the stormwater pump station um, pretty close to the Portland Gresham city line along Marine Drive. The uh, trash rake system is uh, over 20 years old and it's all mechanical uh, and it is very difficult to continue to operate um, and to the point where we're repairing it uh, more, it feels like we're repairing it more than we're operating it. So um, we, we've started the process uh, to uh, re replace those trash rakes. Uh, we're reaching, we'll reach 100% design this week uh, and anticipates uh, do, replacing the work of these assets uh, uh, this summer and, and fall. Um, the top right photo shows an example of some of the work our operations staff do on the, um, on the water. Um, when trees fall into the water, we have to make sure that they're cut up. Um, uh, if they're large enough trees, excuse me, that uh, fall into the water, they must they have to be cut up so they can um, migrate down to the pump stations where uh, we can um, we can uh, remove them. Um, so um, you can see a photo there of uh, what some of our staff using chainsaws in the water um, to make sure that uh, those segments get um, get segmented out. The picture in the middle shows a. Um, uh, a scenario where our staff with uh, work from our contractors and a local crane company was able to pull one of the pumps uh, at the Broadmoor pump station, which is um, fairly close to the um, from close to the airport uh, near um, uh, Marine, not Marine Drive, sorry, Columbia Boulevard. Um, these repairs um, cost, you know, close to you know 10 percent of uh of the total cost of the of the pump and the motor and so we, what we what we try to do is repair our assets as much as we can as long as we can before the assets has to be completely replaced and finally in the bottom right is a um, in a smaller picture of our one of our vehicles doing some herbicide application this happens to be on the levee but we also do applications on the water as well for those of you who float the uh, Columbia Slough and, and or drive past some of the smaller channels, there's a lot of aquatic vegetation that occurs in the summertime. Um, most of that's invasive. Uh, and so we try to knock that down as best we can, um, but it requires constant uh, attention. So next top slide, please. So that was on the internal drainage um, side of the system. And then so next sorry slide. to interrupt you. Could you just say a little bit about why it's important to keep that water moving? Sure. Uh, the water, if we don't, if so if obstructions occur uh, in the in the Columbia Slough, for instance, water will start backing up and uh, start um, inundating properties. The whole area is very, very flat. There's not a lot of slope. Uh, to um, for water to move. Um, so when we have any major obstructions in the slough, uh, it's um, backwater uh, can occur very quickly. Um, and so we want to make sure we keep eyes uh, on the on the on the slough to make sure to minimize that that flood risk. On the levee management side uh, of our work, uh, several things have been happening. I'll highlight just four of these. Uh, first off, uh, there is uh, work that was done this last year to finish an alternative analysis uh, to replace uh, a um, flow control device, basically some gates on the, 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 um, the levee that separates MCDD to its neighboring uh, special districts, the Sandy Drainage Improvement Company. Um, this is a project site that was identified uh, through the FEMA accreditation process. Uh, and in order to reaccredit the levies, which we, which the district is now facing, there are several improvements that have to be made to assets, and this is one of those sites. So uh, we finished the preliminary uh, assessment on what the design solution would be, and so the next step is to go into uh, the design phase, starting with the pre-design phase. The bottom left. Um, 
image shows a, uh, a site where uh, about the, our staff um, did some repair of the levee surface along Marine Drive for about a third of a mile, um, just west of 122nd Avenue. Um, as some of you might know, there was a, a number of homeless encampments along that area. And unfortunately, a lot of the uh, vegetation in the topsoil was um, was um, was stripped down as part of their activities there. Uh, and so we had to go back in and put the uh, topsoil back in and then try to spray it down to have more grass seed reestablish itself. Uh, this was late October. We're, we're expecting to do a, a version of that again this spring uh, in this site, as well as some others uh, further east of this area. The vegetation is super important for the levees because if you don't have those root systems, uh, it, it, the soil will wash away very quickly um, from rainfall, heavy rains. Um, and um, more importantly, uh, it provides sort of a, a first level of armoring if the water levels get in the Columbia River get high enough. Uh, and we do not want the water levels to get down to the point where the original design material is, which is just made of sand. So you, as uh, people who have been to the beach can appreciate sand moves very easily when it's subject to water. And we do not want um, the sand to be um, uh, interacting with the Columbia River water. Top right um, photo is something that uh, we're excited about. Uh, this is an, just some uh, one photo of three test plots that the district is experimenting uh, with uh, native grass seed. Um, and so if you happen to have an interest in uh, going by Marine Drive and 33rd Avenue, maybe just west of 33rd, sorry, just east of 33rd, excuse me. Uh, if you're on the bike path or multi-use path there, you can see those three test plots. So this is a, an image of the uh, just after we hydro seeded that that site we will end up doing some more work in this year. The bottom right represents um, a, a, a excerpt from a report we got from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers following their inspections of the levee. These inspections occur periodically, uh, and we passed uh, their inspection once again, which is very important uh, because we that allows us uh, access to federal funds uh, if a, a major event occurs and we have to um, pay for damages um, in the future. So we wanna make sure the levy stays um, uh, eligible for that program and we are, we are in that situation. So next slide, please. As some of you know, uh, we also, conduct uh, development reviews, reviews of active developments uh, in the throughout the, the, the cities and the county. And uh, we had 69 um, reviews that we completed this completed this last year. There are 17 remaining. Those are the green dots on this map. Um, I wanted to highlight just a couple of reviews, just to give you an example. Um, on the left, the bottom left side, that's kind of a Google aerial view of an area right next to Columbia River. This is an area that's leased, formally leased by the Boy Scouts of America. There's a Sea Scout base there, um, and they've uh, the lease is up, and they're they're going to repurpose uh, that site. And so there are a lot of of structures right against the levee there that um, uh, that the port and others had an interest to remove, but because it's uh, embedded in part of the levee system, we want to make sure that we um, that the proposals were uh, adequate and, and met our design standards uh, when when the work occurs. The top right uh, image um, shows, uh, sorry, it's, it's pretty small, uh, but uh, it shows an area between 185th and interlocking roads on the far northeast corner of the district on uh, the 40 mile loop uh, bike trail is going to be extended uh, in this area, trying to connect the dots between um, existing trails. Um, so if you're driving down Marine Drive uh, and uh, towards Troutdale, uh, in this case, you look off to the right, um, you'll eventually you'll see a small gravel, like a two foot wide gravel path and then the uh, new multi-use path will be um, um, constructed right next to that. So um, that path is going to be uh, continued there and the project will also add some more segments over in, in Fairview and Troutdale as well. Next slide, please. 
So this is my final slide. Um, so I wanted to give you a glimpse on what's uh, happening next. Um, there is an active project on our campus, which is the top left photo um, to install uh, a new water line and, and uh, two lines, actually a water line as well as a, a fire uh, line in order to provide water for fire suppression as needed. Um, so that project is underway now. and uh, We expect that to finish by June of this year. Top right corner uh, is a uh, photo of our cover page of our emergency action plan uh, when floods occur where um, that plan was last updated in 2016 and focused primarily on flooding situations in the Columbia River. Um, we're adding or, or updating those protocols as well as adding uh, new procedures related to flooding situations and internal um, drainage. So um, that it'll be a more comprehensive plan. The bottom right photo uh, or image shows um, it's a bunch of looks like gray and red squiggly lines. Um, those are topo that's a topography map of the levee system closer to our office uh, around um, 21st um, Avenue. Um, this is an area uh, also identified by the FEMA accreditation process. And so this uh, work has to be done in order for the, the FEMA accreditation to be recertified, re sorry, the, the levies to be recertified. Uh, and so uh, people can continue to get uh, discounted uh, uh, flood insurance in our area. But this, this area, um, it's maybe a little hard to see, but um, the contour lines are very close together, sort of towards the bottom, which indicates a very steep slope. Um, and this is the same area or very close to the same area where the um, the flood occurred or the levee broke back in 1947 during the Vanport um, uh, era um, and Vanport flooding. So uh, we need to um, strengthen the levee in this area. Uh, and so we're doing some, we've started the process and we'll continue doing some preliminary engineering analysis on this towards that uh, end and, and FEMA accreditation ultimately. And finally, on the Bottom left uh, is an image of uh, our communication system that allows us to run our pump stations remotely. And uh, this is key for us uh, so we can act quickly uh, to uh, address problems that we know. Um, and it also allows us um, to, um, a, to modify pump station operations and um, save uh, our limited um, staffing resources towards those areas that require manual labor and other things that uh, don't necessarily need to be, can be addressed uh, re uh, remotely. So that's the extent of my slides. Uh, I'm gonna be, certainly stick around and, um, and answer any questions folks have towards the end, but I'll turn it over to Colin for the remainder, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Uh, hi, my name is Colin Rowan. I am the Director of Planning and Public Affairs for Multnomah County Drainage District. And I'm gonna give you a quick update on uh, what's going on with our partnership project with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the Portland Metro Levy System Project. And I think you all able to hear me okay? Anyone give a thumbs up? Yeah, we can make... hear you. Yep. Okay, thank you. There was a weird feedback. Um, so the uh, Portland Metro Levy System study uh, is falls into that category of what's next that Bill is presenting. Um, and uh, a common theme that you'll hear throughout this evening is uh, some of our challenges. We have older infrastructure. It's 100 years old um, for some parts of the levy system. It's in need of repair and upgrade. Uh, and it's also infrastructure that doesn't uh, uniformly meet federal standards. So some parts of the system do meet uh, modern federal standards and others don't. Um, and it's protecting really critical uh, parts of our region. So there's uh, residential properties, there's a lot of commercial, industrial business that happens. It's also a transportation hub for our region uh, and critical infrastructure that serves uh, millions. So with that, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has recognized that uh, there may be a need for federal reinvestment, um, and that happened in 2018 uh, when they awarded uh, the Portland Metro Levy System study. Uh, it started as a three-year feasibility study to see if there was federal interest in reinvestment. Um, next slide, please, Wendy. 
So at that uh, feasibility phase, as the federal government was seeing if there was that interest in making an investment in the system, uh, they set these core objectives uh, that they needed to meet. And they are to reduce flood damages first and foremost, especially life safety. So people living behind the levees, people working behind the levees, um, playing behind the levees, uh, and making sure that the critical infrastructure that we have, including backup water systems for the whole region, uh, power transmission, water, uh, excuse me, uh, natural gas and uh, transportation were all uh, protected. Also, they were looking to increase resiliency and reliability. Uh, if you take a look at the map of the system, we have these cross levees that separate the different districts. Uh, those were built and reinforced after that uh, big flood in the 1940s to the 1948 um, Vanport flood that uh, allow us to keep flooding from uh, basically to sequester it into different sections so it doesn't uh, affect the whole system. Um, and so they also wanted to improve the reliability of those cross levees to make sure that we uh, remained well protected. Um, and then what's really important is for our uh, staff, uh, we have a small and nimble staff to be able to operate a large system, uh, having more things that were automated was an objective. Uh, so Bill showed you a picture of that trash rake system that was being upgraded. It's those types of improvements that the Army Corps uh, wanted to, to make throughout the system so that our staff uh, during flood fighting events uh, were able to go to areas of concern while the rest of the system um, was up and running. Uh, and then they really were taking a look at ways to take advantage of recreational opportunities. Um, many of you may have enjoyed uh, our multi-use paths that are on top of the levee system. We use those as all season access roads, um, but they are a key recreational part um, for our community. There's also uh, water trails and a number of other recreational assets um, behind the levees. And then uh, throughout this, they've really focused on minimizing environmental impacts and using um, designs that reduce the footprint of the levee system without reducing the flood safety of it. Um, Wendy, next page, please, or slide. So uh, finding federal interest in this, system, in this system means that the Corps will come in and uh, help us design uh, the improvements as well as construct the improvements. And at the end of the feasibility stage, which was uh, the summer of 2021, they found that federal interest um, and identified about $140 million of projects that were needed uh, to bring us up to federal standards um, and to meet those objectives that they set. Um, that comes with a two to one match. So for the $140 million, um, our local contribution would be 49 million. Um, so leveraging two federal dollars for every one local dollar. Um, it's a pretty great opportunity to bring the system up to that federal standard. Um, and uh, down here is just a quick look at where we are in this process. So we completed the fe feasibility stage. Um, we are just beginning uh, what's called the pre-construction engineering design phase. It's about a three and a half year phase uh, where all of the designs and specifications uh, permitting and everything else that's needed to construct the project will be completed. Uh, after that, we'll move into the construction phase, and uh, that is estimated to begin in 2026. There are a number of things, uh, milestones that need to be met for us to get um, continue moving through. We've met a number of those milestones. And Wendy, if you go to the next slide, I can just give a quick uh, update on where we are on those and what might be coming up soon. So what's new is that we've uh, accomplished a couple of the really big milestones needed to move this project forward. Uh, in December of uh, this past year, 2022, in the Water Resources Development Act, uh, a act of Congress authorized the construction of this project. Um, so that congressional authorization really is the green light for a lot of um, the upcoming uh, work that will get done. We also need to get annual appropriations. So just like any kind of um, budget, that needs to be approved every year. The federal government needs to approve uh, that year's work. And so that's the annual appropriations. We were included in the FY23 appropriations, um, and that has led us to begin this design phase. And we're working to get uh, the next year's appropriations as well. Um, so we're in a good place to keep moving this project. This summer, um, and actually, Wendy, it would be good to move to the next one. Um, this summer, we're going to begin this design phase. and 
uh, us, uh, the MCDD and the three other drainage districts are the local sponsor of that. And we're responsible for leading the communications and community involvement. And we know that uh, some of the projects that have been identified um, do uh, take place on, on property that might uh, belong to people that are attending this meeting. Um, almost everyone that has uh, property that is um, a part of this levy system has already been uh, consulted with by the Army Corps as well as with us. Um, so for awareness, as we begin this design process, we're going to go back through a similar process, reaching out to community members, uh, property owners, having a kickoff and open house and providing as much information um, as possible about where that process is. Um, and again, as we move towards actual construction, um, where there will be more uh, or potential impacts as far as the, the construction of it, um, we'll continue to work um, to make the community aware of that. We also will continue a, a really strong collaborative effort um, between the districts, the cities of Portland, Gresham, Troutdale, Fairview, um, the interstate bridge replacement project and that um, by state team um, is co coordinated with, and then regional par partners of uh, Metro, Port of Portland, Multnomah counties and others um, are, have all come together to support this effort and to streamline uh, the, the construction phase. So with that, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Aster and please do put any questions into the chat and hopefully be able to address them later. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. So my name is Aster Moulton. I am the Public Affairs and Community Relations Specialist uh, with the Drainage Districts and I manage our response to houseless activity within the Drainage Districts and also illegal dumping. And I'm here to give you an update on that program. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the program can be distilled into three main categories. The first is to provide education and supportive housing services to individuals living within the drainage district service area, living outside within the drainage district service area. And that's primarily done through our partnership with a social service agency, Cascadia Health. And that really helps us have a service first oriented approach when engaging these individuals, a trauma-informed approach rather than going straight to enforcement. And it also helps us in case of high, in the cases of high water events, the houseless community is often the most vulnerable. So it allows us to do early outreach to that community. And we do focus on individuals um, living uh, directly on or adjacent to our flood protection infrastructure. Um, second, we uh, clean up uh, any illegal dumping on and around our flood protection infrastructure, infrastructure especially when it has any potential um, uh, emergency response concerns or operational concerns. And um, both of these goals work towards what is our ultimate goal of ensuring that our crew has safe and efficient efficient access to our flood safety infrastructure so that they can respond to emergencies and do um, their necessary operations and maintenance. Next slide. So our crew is trying to do their job in less than ideal conditions, which has led to uh, mental fatigue, exhaustion, distraction, exposure to violence and hazardous materials, um, especially since uh, 2020 when the houseless issue in the region got pretty bad. Um, however, over the past year, uh, conditions with MCDD have improved pretty dramatically, and that's in large part thanks to other agency partners that have stepped up to manage houselessness and illegal dumping. Um, a lot of our flood safety infrastructure is, is located on property owned by these agencies, um, and it's been great to have their partnership. And as a result, we haven't experienced any major uh, operational delays due to illegal dumping or houselessness activity over the past uh, six, to nine, six to nine months or so, which is great. Next slide. So I'd like to give you um, an update on some key areas of success. Uh, the first is the Marine Drive Levy. Um, so thanks to the Port of Portland, Metro, and the City of Portland, who are the major landowners along the Marine Drive levee. There's been numerous cleanup efforts over the past year or so um, with focus on the area between I-205 and um, Northeast uh, 122nd. Um, there's been a lot of concentrated and prolonged activity there. 
Um, and see, here are some before and after photos of that area. You can see that about a year ago, um, there was a lot of trash and debris, abandoned vehicles, hazardous materials. And here's a picture of that same location six months later, um, obviously a lot more clear and accessible. And um, as last I heard, this area is still um, fairly clear. Next slide. Another very large cleanup effort um, was led by the city of Portland's impact reduction program. Um, it was the cleanup of one of our cross levees, um, Northeast 142nd, um, that happened this past summer. Uh, most of the land on and around um, the cross levee is owned by the city of Portland, and they did a great job coordinating with us and other adjacent landowners to get the work done. And I would say it's still not perfect, but it's a lot better than, it, what, than what it was. And our crew does have um, better access to a really important culvert that runs under this levee. And, you know, these two pictures were taken about a year apart. And I think, I think the difference speaks volumes. Next slide. So another huge success was the comprehensive cleanup of the Big Four Corners natural area, which was also led by the City of Portland's Impact Reduction Program. Uh, as some of you probably know, there is an important pump station located in the northwest corner of the Big Four Corners natural area. And um, you know, up until pretty recently, there was some violent activity happening around our pump station, which made it um, uh, difficult and uh, unsafe to access. Um, and right now our crew does feel fairly safe accessing this pump station um, in large part thanks to this cleanup effort and uh, we have reliable and consistent access, which is great. Next slide. So in addition to leveraging the resources of other agencies, we do have our own contract with rapid response bioclean to help remove illegal dumping, which is um, helpful when we need a really quick turnaround or when illegal dumping is located directly on drainage district property. Um, so in 2022, rapid response moved um, nearly 30,000 pounds of trash and debris in MCDD and Pen2. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we tend to focus our resources towards issues that are immediately impacting our operations, but you can always reach out to us at info at mcdd.org um, with an issue and we'll do our best to respond. And if it's ultimately outside of our jurisdiction, we can help, uh, help you get in touch with another agency that can help you. Um, can you go back, please? Thanks. Um, yeah, and uh, other ways to report, um, you, uh, within the city of Portland, you can report directly to their one point of contact system. Um, for illegal dumping, you can report to Metro's RID patrol program and they'll respond to any illegal dumping on pro public property within the Metro area. And you can also stay on the lookout for any um, solve events within MCDD. Sometimes we do partner with solve um, to clean up portions of the levy system. Yeah, so um, yeah, I can address any immediate questions now um, and we can save some towards the end as well. I think one question right now, Aster, would be who pays for the rapid response cleanup? Um, that would be MCDD. It comes, uh, we, budget, uh, we budget for it every year. And I think we can address the other ones at the end. Sounds good. You do have a hand raised as well. Hi, hi. I had a question about the response to the pump four. I think it was pump four that we we couldn't run because of the, you know, activity around it. It was unsafe. Um, I know that during that time there was an issue with calling the uh, Multnomah County poli uh, police and they came out and they said, well, it's not in their jurisdi jurisdiction. And the Portland police were called and they came out and they said it wasn't in their jurisdiction. And then finally somebody did something and they were able to get in there. Um, is that kind of squared away now as far as if it does come to the point where the, we can't get to that pump because of activity, um, we know who to call or who's responsible? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I will say that we have a really great partnership with the um, city of Portland, with BES and the Water Bureau. They all have infrastructure in that area, and we're all collectively committed to keeping that area um, uh, 
accessible and clear. And so we're trying to, uh, to manage the issue before it gets out of hand. Um, and yeah, we feel really good about our efforts so far, but I think if we did need to call on police support, we know that um, city of Portland police would respond to any emergencies. And I will also say that actually we have a great partnership with the Port of Portland and they've been, um, they've been willing to um, assist our crew in accessing portions of our infrastructure as well. Jim, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just want to say that uh, the Portland police never that it wasn't in their jurisdiction. It was just they had other high priority calls. So they did send an officer and that officer was there until the sheriff could fill in for the other calls that were higher priority for the Portland police, mostly gun violence. So uh, the city has done its best and candidly, we're seeing a, a much more coordinated and effective response from a variety of partners uh, over the last year. So, uh, and great support from Multnomah County and the sheriffs as well. But thank you for oh, the question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no problem. So it is clear that it's under the Portland Police Bureau, Bureau jurisdiction, not Multnomah County. That is correct. And the good news, okay. North, Pre North Precinct is the appropriate headquarters to call, um, but we do have a good relationship with the sheriff and they work together to try and provide coverage if we need it. The good news is, because the area has been completely cleaned up and we've done some work to secure our access to our site, that conditions are, are significantly improved. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, great, good news, thank you. There was a question asked her about how much we're spending on the rapid response work and I was looking for that number. I don't have it at my fingertips. I don't either, but I could follow up with someone on that number okay i know i know we're uh we're proposing spending less next year because conditions are improving and it's uh but i don't know what the specific for that rapid response file clean aspect of it is my regrets yeah. we'll definitely get that figured out and get back to you if you could email wendy we can make sure to follow up with you with that number uh, on MCD, the total budget for houseless cleanup for 22-23 was $200,000, but I do believe we're estimating that those costs are going to be slightly less than that, and we are um, in the process of budgeting for 23-24, and right now the proposed budget has a smaller number than that um, going forward into the upcoming fiscal year. Thank you, Lori. Esther, there's a question about signage, and I, I know that you have been doing some more things around that. Could you briefly talk about that? Yeah, so we have put signage up in some um, critical areas, like around Pump Station 4 and also our Schmier Road Pump Station around um, Pen 2. Um, and it is our plan to start to implement more signage um, throughout the drainage districts. Great. We're going to continue with the presentations and then um, answer some additional questions at the end. Great. Good evening, everybody. My name is Matt Berlin, and I'm the emergency planner and uh, project manager with MCDD. And tonight, wanted to give you a brief overview of our flood season preparation, share some resources with you, and talk a little bit about the emergency management or emergency operations program and what we're doing to prepare ourselves. Next slide. Uh, a little bit overview of our program. Uh, in addition to our standard operations of uh, weekly inspections and maintenance of the levee system and the drainage system inside the levees and uh, conducting system improvements, um, we're working a lot on emergency planning, uh, our emergency operations. And as Bill mentioned, our emergency action plans, um, including the flood emergency action plan of 2016 is being updated and incorporating internal drainage emergency action plans as well. Uh, and some of you may know that we are currently uh, joining the Multnomah County Multi-Jurisdictional Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan, we'll, which will open up access to federal funding to support additional uh, mitigation measures for natural hazards. Uh, and a big part of that um, over the last few years uh, included a public survey in 2021 and the feedback that we received from that survey um, was incorporated into that plan. Uh, and so we're excited to get that incorporated. We look forward to uh, having that 
adopted over uh, the next few months. Um, in addition, uh, we continue to have a training requirement for all staff within the incident command system, the FEMA framework uh, for incident command and members of our incident management team take more advanced training and often will go into specialized training for uh, different roles in the incident management team. Next slide. Uh, you'll see the graphic on the bottom with, with the uh, gradation of colors that is uh, from our flood emergency action plan and describes how at different levels in the Columbia River, different flood elevations that we adapt our operations and our emergency activation. Um, and a big part of our program is conducting exercises that practice that process. And in the fall, we conducted a tabletop exercise with our incident management team and we'll conduct another one this spring. Uh, in addition, we're partnering with PBOT on their uh, stop log closure uh, along uh, Marine Drive, and that'll happen in April 2023. And we'll be uh, participating in Multnomah County's Cascadia exercise in June of 2023 as well, um, so later this year. And then in the fall, we're looking at an internal drainage exercise for, for our staff um, once we have our new in, uh, internal drainage emergency action plan in place. Um, so it's really all about uh, getting our plans in place and then trying to practice them, figuring out what we need to improve over time. Uh, and that really comes into play, especially when we uh, when we face high water events. Uh, next slide, please. And some of you may remember the June 2022 high water event. Uh, we did, uh, there was an emergency declared and we did activate our incident management team. There was moderately heavy rain that triggered elevated water levels uh, in the Columbia River and there were some internal drainage issues. Uh, the levees performed as designed as and did not sustain uh, any damage from high water. Uh, we did have uh, a good amount of public involvement and outreach, uh, including the houseless community that was alerted when we reached um, that yellow line there, that flood elevation. Um, and so um, we did we did activate and we did um, conduct the, uh, the, the needed actions that we follow for that. And uh, it was a successful opportunity um, to sort of sort of use those tools and and uh, and prepare for that event. Um, and it went without without cause. Uh, next slide. And we also had uh, uh, some significant storms over uh, in December, uh, you may remember, um, up to four inches in 48 hours, which was the equivalent of a five-year storm event. Uh, we did not activate uh, our incident management team and it was not declared an emergency. Uh, the internal drainage system functioned as expected with no major failures, but the system was running at capacity. And so it's a good opportunity for us to look at that event and look at how the system ran um, so that we can uh, be prepared for the next one in case it's a little bit bigger or pushes us outside of our capacity. Um, let's see the next slide. So looking ahead over the next few months, the next uh, spring and the next 90 days, um, there is an above average snowpack in our region. Um, and you can see in this map here that the watersheds that are draining into the Columbia are over 100% of their typical snowpack. So we expect that the snowmelt will be a major contributor um, to the flood season. You can go to the next slide. And this slide here, um, if you look at the black line, there's the current forecast um, and the blue, green and red lines are climate uh, predictions and the statistical possibility of there being a combination of snow melt and rainfall. As you can see it, it uh, in the highest percentile or 10% um, possibility that it will exceed our flood stage. And so we wanna make sure that we're we're prepared for the combination of snow melt and precipitation this coming spring. We see those, um, all those pieces are in place. And so we want to be ready for that. You can go to the next slide. Um, so it's just a reminder that uh, there's some really essential facts about levees that we, we want to be mindful of that flooding does occur and that uh, levees are designed to really mitigate or reduce the risk, but that, but that floods do happen. And so we just need to be prepared. And not only do, does MCDD and the districts uh, need to be prepared, but homeowners need to take the responsibility and be prepared as well. And part of our role is to provide resources to help you do that um, so that we can protect the lives and property within the districts. Um, next slide. And so really provided a link here to make sure that you can um, access it at your convenience. I'm gonna put it in the chat. 
Um, but you know, there's some tips that we provide on the MCDD website about creating an emergency kit, making a plan should there be a flood, and staying informed. Lots of resources there that you can access on your own. Um, and um, we're here to provide uh, assistance if you need it. Um, and I look forward to uh, having some questions and answers if you have any. Thanks for your time. Matt, I don't know if you want, there was a question about what's the expected impact of a Cascadia event. So that sounds like a longer topic conversation. Is there a way to briefly answer that? Or do you? I, I can say that I think it would be sub substantial and, I, and um, the Cascadia event is really the extreme event that the county and all of our multi interjurisdictional partners are, are preparing for. Um, within the levy system, um, I think we're trying to understand more about what to expect. Um, there are lots of scenarios that I think it would take a while to, to go through, but I, I would expect a Cascadia event to be uh, substantial. And I welcome any other um, of my colleagues to chime in if you if you'd like to. <laughs> I can briefly share. Um, we have done some analysis on pump stations. So I think, uh, you know, the levees are made out of sand and silt. Um, they are in liquefiable grounds. Um, and so, as Matt said, um, it's pretty substantial. The, um, you know, worst case scenario is higher flood elevations at the same time of a major uh, subduction zone earthquake. Um, there's actually been statistical analysis done on that by OSU. It is incredibly small, but the real risk is knowing what we need to repair after an earthquake. Um, and so we do have uh, some scope and we just need to be able to have the funding um, to find out basically what that likelihood is throughout the system so that we'd be able to effectively triage. Um, so that is definitely a project that we wanna do and that way we'd be able to really focus our resources on repairing the areas um, that are damaged, maybe not even be able to be seen as damaged um, before the next flood event. Um, and that's really what we'll be focusing on and, and hopefully be able to prioritize that type of study. It is, it would be a pretty expensive um, labor intensive study. Uh, as far as actually fortifying those levees uh, so that they're themselves uh, earthquake resistant, um, I won't dig up any of the actual numbers of it, but I know that the Port of Portland uh, is looking to make their runway uh, seismically stable, um, and they're looking at tens of millions of dollars just for that stretch, and we're talking about uh, 27 miles of linear levy, so it would be prohibitively expensive, so really looking to triage and trying to um, uh, take care of the parts that might be damaged. Great, yeah, so if there's no other questions on that, I have another presentation for you all. Uh, Wendy, if you can go to the next slide. So um, we have a new budding initiative uh, called Flood Safe Columbia River, and it's an initiative to raise broad regional awareness about the flood protection system along the Columbia River. While you and your neighbors may be really aware, aware of this system, um, the majority of people uh, throughout the region have no idea that this system exists, even though that they benefit from it. So the goal is to provide education and engagement on the various ways to upgrade uh, the flood protection infrastructure and manage flood risks into the future. Um, this initiative represents uh, the ongoing work of key community stakeholders in the region um, working to improve flood control, which includes the existing drainage districts, as well as that, as that new agency that Jim mentioned created by the Oregon legislature, the Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District that will ultimately take over management of the flood protection system. Next slide. So uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, the flood protection system uh, protects the region against Columbia River high water levels. Uh, the Columbia River is one of the world's largest, most powerful rivers. It starts in British Columbia. It's over uh, 1200 miles long and it has a drainage basin roughly the size of France. And within that drainage basin, there's a lot of rain and snow melt that collects in the river and affects water levels that our levee system ultimately has to protect against. Next slide. 
So more and more across the world, we are seeing more intense, more frequent heavy rain events and rapid snow melt that is causing unprecedented flooding. Um, for instance, the atmospheric river that arrived in California this past winter that caused devastating flooding could have easily traveled north to our region and uh, it is likely we may have experienced similar impacts. So as a region, we need to be more adaptive and resilient to these climate change driven extreme weather events that we are already seeing and are likely uh, going to experience more of. Next slide. So when people think of climate change, um, people often think of droughts, uh, uh, wildfires, and extreme heat. And the other side of the coin is that it also causes more frequent, um, stronger, more intense, heavy rains, uh, which can cause flooding. Next slide. Um, so major flooding has happened uh, in our region before. A lot of people know about the Columbia River flood of 1948 that destroyed the city of Vanport um, and displaced 18,000 people in under an hour. And the flood protection system that failed 75 years ago is the same one that still exists in our region today. Next slide. And it's only a matter of, a matter of time before it happens again. Um, here are some recent floodings um, that happened either due to failed flood protection infrastructure, failed levees or pump stations, or um, because of heavy rains, uh, so, yeah, rain so heavy that flood protection infrastructure couldn't keep up even if it was functioning at its highest capacity. Next slide. So as Colin mentioned, um, our flood control infrastructure no longer meets federal standards. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, uh, FEMA and the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, overhauled their levy uh, safety standards. And when we were informed of this, we conducted geotechnical assessments of our system and found that our system no longer meets these new standards. And meeting these standards is obviously important because we wanna keep our communities as safe as possible, um, but also because meeting these standards will help us recertify the levy system, which will help keep flood insurance for property owners within the managed floodplain uh, voluntary and affordable. Next slide. So the flood protection system is nearly 100 years old. It's as old as the drainage districts themselves and requires urgent upgrades. And you know, while we're constantly doing um, small levee repairs and pump station repairs and replacements and adding new infrastructure here and there, uh, there have been no major upgrades or improvements to the system since the 1948 flood. And overall, uh, unfortunately, our resilience to flood events is is fairly low, and that's in part because of the capacity of our pump stations is low and um, redundancy in power supply is minimal. Um, there have been several projects, as Colin was talking about, identified by the Army Corps of Engineers in FEMA that will help recertify our system and bring it up to federal safety standards. And there are also projects that have been identified by various drainage district planning efforts that will help us invest in long-term flood safety. Next slide. So um, more about the solutions, we can keep going. Um, fortunately, the examples that I mentioned are um, simple and cost-effective. At a very high level, they include expanding the levees and flood walls in the most vulnerable areas, upgrade aging pumps and increasing capacity to remove water um, from the internal drainage area that Bill was talking about. And it also includes a project to build a new levee along the railroad embankment that failed in 1948 and destroyed the city of Vanport. Uh, that railroad embankment was never built to levee standards and the characteristics of it remain the same as it was when it when it failed 75 years ago. Next slide. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we are working towards a solution. Uh, I think Jim mentioned the opportunity to receive a, a federal government match for over 100 million in local investments to help uh, bring the system up to safety standards. Um, and I mentioned this new uh, agency um, that will ultimately replace the four drainage districts, the Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District. Um, it includes new mission areas to contribute to improved water quality 
fish and wildlife habitat and landscape resilience. And um, it will promote equity and social justice in all aspects of the new district's operations. And it also has uh, mission areas related to providing information about the natural ecology and cultural history of the area. Um, before the levee system, it was a natural and braided wetlands and also um, uh, requires us to prepare and adapt to climate change. Um, and acting now will prote uh, protect lives, homes, environmental quality, and will ultimately save uh, millions of dollars in a disaster recovery. Next slide. So a key part of climate resiliency is incorporating nature-based solutions into how we manage flooding. Open spaces and wetlands can help slow and store floodwaters, which will reduce pressure on our levees and pump stations. And um, when these areas are not actively managing flooding, they also support clean water and provide habitat for fish and wildlife. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we're making some active progress towards implementing some of these upgrades and system improvements. Next slide. Uh, so as Colin mentioned, the Portland Metro Levy System design work is really one of the first steps uh, towards upgrading our system to meet those safety standards. Um, we have funding for design through the end of the year and we'll, um, we look forward to working with property owners uh, throughout the managed floodplain on that work. Um, and we've also been updating our capital, capital improvement plan, which provides recommendations for how we're going to improve our system's resiliency to flood events in the long term. And we're developing a bond package that will fund existing flood safety plans and nature-based solutions. So next slide. Here's a little bit more about what you can expect to see in a, in a general obligation bond. Um, it will fund the local match for the projects that will help us meet the federal safety standards. Um, right now, design is funded, but we'll need funding for construction, and this, this geobond package would help us um, uh, make that funding possible. Um, and once again, one outcome of that is the continued availability of discounted uh, voluntary flood insurance available to property owners in the managed floodplain. Um, and ultimately, other outcomes include our ability to respond and manage heavy rain events and our ability to prepare and respond to emergencies. And um, once again, this uh, uh, bond measure will help us meet our new mandates for the new district. Um, we'll incorporate nature-based solutions into our flood safety projects and uh, integrate equity as well. Um, we're planning on conducting some community engagement and educational activities around various geobond scenarios this summer. Um, so stay tuned and let us know if you're interested in participating in that as we move forward. And you can expect to see something on the ballot um, sometime in 2024. Next slide. Um, so a key piece and a huge opportunity uh, that we have with this new agency is the potential for regional support for investment in this system. Um, since the drainage districts were established um, for the past hundred years, um, the only the property owners in the levee protected area have been contributing to the system, even though there are regional wide, uh, regional region wide benefits. So the boundaries of this entire agency is the area in white, which represents urban Multnomah County. Um, that's the area that receives the greatest economic benefits from this system. And the geo bond would go out to voters in this entire area. And if approved, um, this, the entire region would contribute to our uh, flood safety infrastructure upgrades. Uh, next slide. So you can learn more at floodsafecolumbia.org and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I, I have a question for you about the certification. What um, would be the timing for when the area would be recertified for, I don't know, you're talking about some changes to the flood insurance. Colin, could you address that? Thank you. Yes, thanks for that question. Um, so the flood, the, 
the recertification will likely take place at the very end of the PMLS project with the Army Corps of Engineers. So that's expected to be in 2032. Uh, the important thing is that um, FEMA, we, we connect with FEMA and check in with them about twice a year on progress towards meeting that goal of recertification. So they're fully aware that we're making progress on that work. They're also aware that we're taking measures um, and, and know where those uh, areas that need to be addressed are so that we can um, pay attention to them during flood events and mitigate them as necessary. Um, so right now, because we're making progress toward uh, those recertification projects with PMLS and uh, locally, we're not at risk of being um, remapped. And so we maintain accreditation. Um, and what that means is that uh, if you have property behind the levy, you are not required to have mandatory flood insurance. It is available and it's discounted through the National Flood Insurance Program. And it also allows the cities to zone that land as they currently have it. Um, if we didn't have accreditation, they would have to change the zoning. Um, so uh, we are on track for maintaining accreditation um, and we're making good progress. Thank you. And, uh, okay, Tom, thank you. Jim, there was a question, uh, why is a new district needed? Why can't the four districts do that? Thank you for that question. Um, the four districts don't have the financial capacity or authority to do a general obligation bond. Um, so based on the fact that only the landowners in the affected floodplain or managed floodplain are responsible for paying, the legislature created a new district that incorporates all of Multnomah County. The entire region benefits from the flood safety system. And so the staff with the new interim appointed 17 member board is working to establish a broader revenue base to help pay for the system and offset some of those costs. Other questions we didn't answer. There's more chat here. Colin answered the design phase. Wendy, do you, I can't see who went first. It sounds like uh, we have some questions about the lake and we have people with hands raised. Yeah, let's, um, let's take the hand raise and then um, Bill, I'd love if you could address the questions related to Fairview Lake. Sorry, I don't want to get your name wrong. I think Mandana was first and then Peter. Yeah, way to go. It's rare that somebody says it right on the first try. Um, one of the problems that we've been having, I manage an industrial building um, that is adjacent to the slough. And um, we've had deadfall trees falling over and hitting our roof and, and causing damage. But we're told we can't you know, there's like no money for the maintenance of those trees. And some of them require an arborist. You have to get a plan to prove that you can trim it or remove it. It just seems like a quagmire. Is any of that aspect of the maintenance of the, the plants that are beyond our property line in the slough, um, is that gonna be incorporated in this urban, the big long acronym or or any any other, budgetary plans coming forward because um, otherwise we're just coming out of pocket or our tenants coming out of pocket to to deal with that. Bill, I'm going to ask you to take the first crack at that one. Thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, so, uh, Mandana, we're in the same boat as you are. Uh, we have to abide by the same um, um, urban, uh, sorry, uh, municipal um, codes for street uh, tree protection, um, and we too have to employ an arborist in order to take down any trees that uh, are alive. And so the only ones that we really are uh, really addressing uh, are ones that have already fallen into the water, A, or B, um, create a safety hazard for our staff uh, to continue to perform work on the water, uh, or, or do inspections. And so um, if you want to connect with me um, um, after this meeting and, uh, and, and forward me your, your property 
uh, location and uh, some photos of things and locations where the trees might be. Um, I'm, I'm happy to um, to follow up with that, uh, but no, our um, our ability to respond is also limited, similar to yours. Thank you for being here, Topher. Uh, looks like Peter. Howdy. Good evening. Um, given climate change, sea rise, and then of course you've got snow melt, rainfall, and high tides. The last time I walked the dike, uh, the river was uh, just cresting the clay core, uh, but that was that wasn't a that was a walk in the park compared to what I see coming, and 32 seems like an awful long way out. Um, we, you know, given that we've got that railroad uh, dike that's uh, marginal, and that we're not getting any lift on, on any of the other dikes, uh, what's what's the thinking? Colin, you unmuted. Yes. No, I, I think that's yeah, that's a great point, Peter. The um, the end point of 2032 is to complete all the construction projects and um, it will be phased out. The construction phase won't begin until 2026. Um, so, uh, you know, we are still a few years out. We have to go through the design process with the core to do that. Um, but I, I think what's really important is, uh, you know, being aware of where those issue areas are, um, being able to, um, during high water, go out there and our crew goes, uh, they know where there's boils, where water kind of comes through, passes through the levee on the landward side, um, observes those and make sure that they're not passing silt through there. Um, and so there are a lot of mitigation actions that we can take during high water as we're addressing the complicated construction and financing of making those upgrades. Um, and the first part of your question is really important around uh, climate change and a changing environment. Um, on the uh, Army Corps PMLS uh, website, and I can, I'll can i put a link into it after I um, answer this, uh, they have all of the different um, chapters uh, and, and some of it's pretty dense, but there's a summary part of it that's kind of like an executive summary. And part of it is uh, specific to climate change. And so they did a hydraulic analysis um, of, or uh, hyd a hydrology and hydraulic analysis of the whole um, watershed that Bill was talking about earlier. And they were really looking at the likelihood of um, more warm uh, rain events on our snowpack during the winter as one of the biggest risk drivers for our whole system. And they designed um, their improvements based on that higher likelihood that comes with climate change. Um, so the likelihood of higher high water um, and changing it from the annual freshet that happens every year as the snowpack melts, um, that can be really well controlled generally based on dam operations higher in the system. Um, but what our real risk is, is during the winter months, similar to 1996, uh, that event was during the winter when there was a, a warm up, there was a big rain event, and then it hit the snowpack. And so that's really what we're trying to prepare for. But um, I do, you know, it does take time. And uh, nine years is is a while, but um, I think we're going to try to address things through mitigation and and being really uh, knowledgeable about the system during high water to to maintain it well. Uh, Jim Loventhal. Yes, I'm uh, wanted to ask about the timing of the design. Um, in the course, the core had kind of laid out a couple three phases for the uh, construction projects. And I thought that the time that they were thinking about the design being different packages of design is, or is all the design going to be accomplished in one one major phase? Yeah. Colin, you're muted. You're the person with the. Sorry about missing that. Um, so yes, the, there are there's 
right now three phases for the construction, but one phase for design. Um, so you're, you're correct that they had identified those three phases. The design phase is um, mostly all taking place at the same time. Um, there are a few parts of the um, design package that are just going to be far more complicated. In particular, the work that is being done along Marine Drive and along Bridgeton Road in um, Penn 2, Peninsula Drainage District 2 uh, within the city of Portland is really complicated because there are just- I'll call you back. There's just so many pieces of it mm -hmm. that are involved. Um, everything from uh, raising utilities to making sure that everyone maintains access to their homes, uh, sidewalk and curb, all those things make it really complicated. Um, and so the, the design will all take place at once. The construction is gonna take place in three phases. They're gonna focus first on the pump station. Part of that is um, knowing about sort of more atmospheric rivers and, um, you know, making sure that we have that ability to operate our system. They're going to focus on the pump station. Um, some of the projects that are in um, Troutdale and Fairview first, then they're going to do the projects that are in um, MCDD and along the south side of, a, of the SLU um, in MCDD and Pen 2 and Pen 1, uh, Peninsula Drainage District 2 and Peninsula D Drainage District 1. And then the final phase of the project, um, once they have all of the kind of complicating factors uh, sorted out. And, and us as the local sponsors are gonna be responsible for um, doing a lot of that legwork. Um, that final phase will be doing the railroad embankment and the work on um, Marine Drive and, and Bridgeton Road. Thank you. Um, Thank you. you did ask one question. Would you mind if we had Bill address some questions that came in before the meeting about Fairview Lake? And then we can come back to you. Is that acceptable? Bill, are you could you talk about lake levels and the importance of lake levels at Fairview Lake, please? Yeah. One I, question about dredging. Right. And one question about dredging. So um right. So Fairview Lake uh is a, a natural lake on the far uh east side of the of the drainage district for those who are not familiar with that geography. But um, that lake uh, has uh, a couple of uh, water permits that the state has granted uh, for multiple uses. Uh, and uh, one of those uses uh, includes flood storage. And um, the district, uh, the city of Fairview, uh, and the, one of the, the main uh, uh, homeowners association has uh, come into an agreement uh, and has had an agreement for many years now of how to operate uh, lake level, how, how to operate the uh, outfall structure there to that will allow water to rise and fall. Um, district staff has learned over years of experience that it's of great value to have flood storage available during the wet weather season, um, primarily from uh, October to uh, into May. Um, particularly the, the convective storms that come through our area um, that can drop a lot of rain and fall in the spring uh, can generate a lot of water very quickly. And so having that flood storage available to us um, to help uh, reduce flood risk, not only along uh, the, um, the lake, along the, the shoreline of Fairview Lake, but just as importantly downstream of Fairview Lake and Gresham and in East Portland. And so as such, um, we've agreed, um, for those three entities agreed to have water levels rise and fall um, to accommodate for flood storage. Uh, so in short, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact elevations, but um, it's a little less than 12 foot elevation that we dropped the water to in October to um, generate that flood storage. Uh, and then uh, we allow the, um, uh, with and, um, with partnerships with the other two entities to let the water rise uh, to its full level uh, during the dry months um, and right so um, in in those cases um, historically that's that seems to be the best way for us to be able to minimize flood risk uh, for that area. Um, since I've been in my position here, I have looked back at the rainfall patterns uh, in uh, in our area, 
Um, and uh, following that uh, analysis, I have recommended and we've implemented in the most recent uh, agreements that the uh, the timing when the water can rise up to its full level, um, it's no longer in um, on Memorial Day, but May 1st. So it's an additional time for for full um, for, for that water to be up to that point. Uh, it does create a little more risk for us. Um, and we do have the option to um, to drop it again, um, but uh, statistically speaking, there's l less chance of uh, major um, storm events uh, during the month of May. So that's why we have um, um, we have um, water levels where they are. Um, I, sorry, I forgot to mention that um, another reason for giving the water levels, uh, dropping the water levels in the fall, it helps flush down a lot of the detritus uh, and vegetation that has died um, uh, at the beginning of the fall uh, and allows us to actually clean up that, um, uh, that material out of the slough because if we cannot do that, we cannot run pump station four, which is the main um, uh, feature to reduce flood risk out there. So um, that's it, that flushing effect that allows us to do that is super important for our operations. Uh, as far as dredging, I understand from historical records that the district has dredged Fairview Lake back in the 50s and maybe into the 60s or so, but uh, less so uh, since that point, and we have not done it recently. Um, that is not an area where we actively manage, um, and, but I understand that there are some sedimentation issues uh, at, in the lake. Um, and so I have, we've been talking with um, the city of Fairview staff, um, as well as some of the homeowner associations about what we can do to help partner um, with those other entities to try to address some of the, the, the sediment um, uh, issues up in that area. And uh, we provide some technical information to the city of Fairview staff to look at options. Um, so and we'll continue to be in dialogue with that. So I hope that, um, Hope that answers the water level and dredging topics. Too. If I could well, follow yep. up on that, um, the question I was asking specifically about the dredging was if Fairview Lake was dredged, you know, since it's been 50 or 60 years, would that improve the buffer for the entire system if it had more capacity? Or if or is that? not a drop in the bucket <laughs> yeah that's um it's it's a fair question and uh, honestly the short answer is i don't know because uh, i haven't right. examined that close enough to know what the impact is or benefit is to downstream risk or flood risk so yeah um, I, I yeah i'm sorry i just i don't have a clear answer for you but i just we just have to do the, that analysis and um, yeah it's, it's not a it's it's a fairly it's a fair amount of work to do so Oh, I could imagine. I just wanted to know if it had been, you know, if it was on the table, something to think about, hey, we could add this many million gallons of capacity by doing that. So, right. all right, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Peter, you've been very patient, but I also want to get to a question that was in the chat early on um, related to the budget process and what's the best way for people to find out more about the annual budget. So we do have a budget meeting coming up. The date is escaping me. Wendy, you probably know. Uh, April 25th. April 25th is when the proposed budget will be shared with the MCDD board. Um, the current fiscal year adopted budget, I have to get my notes. Well, all those are on the website as They're well. They're all on the website, so you can see. I guess the one thing I will share is that um, we're proposing no new employees or anything in the, the coming year budget we're trying to hold things uh pretty tight uh because we're trying to be responsible with your money so more to come on that and if there are specific questions uh probably Lori or i could try and take them up for you peter you're muted thank you yeah I was uh, wondering if you had any information on the fire suppression chemicals from the airport. How, what you know, what it did to the fish, the ecology, the you know, 
uh, I had a white tailed deer come through not too long ago. And so we got those guys hanging out there too. Uh, you know, we are in the conveyance business, not the water quality business per se. Bill, you may have a little more information or call in from the environmental program perspective. I know the port works really hard to maintain good relationships and compliance with DEQ and uh, EPA and all the other regulatory agencies. Uh, I don't have much else to add. I'm afraid uh, Jim's response was was pretty comprehensive. We just we haven't focused on the water quality end. Uh, we will be um, much more so when the new district begins, um, but that's not our focus currently. I can tell you that we operate the um, pump station just downstream of of the uh, port um, to help them meet their water quality permit requirements for the de-icing facility. So I'm not, but I have not heard from them about uh, the fire suppression um, chemicals that you're referencing. So that's for that's Can where... Can I see you're unmuted? Do you wanna speak to this? Yeah, I'm certainly not an expert in this field from the port. Uh, I do know that we were, I believe the first agency to partner with DEQ uh, before it was uh, even being considered being a regulated constituent to do a analysis of our our different sites, so we're actively working with the regulate you know, regulatory agencies to uh, see what there's no from what I understand there's not yet regulations developed, but they're they're on the horizon. So we've been working with them on what is an acceptable level, uh, and uh, that's about all I know. But I just wanted to let you know that. You know, we were taking it very seriously and have, have volunteered to, uh, uh, you know, investigate our sites where, where we did have PFOS discharges from fire suppression foam. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> um, we had a question in the chat about vandalism, and we, like many other infrastructure providers, including the port and the city of Portland um, and others, are experiencing some vandalism of our system. Um, I think it was, Bill, was it two weekends ago, we did experience some vandalism at pump station, pump station four and the controller box that helps us uh, automate the trash rakes that keep the pumps functioning was damaged. We were able to make some uh, near-term repairs to keep the pump station operational and we're working on longer-term repairs. When Lori earlier mentioned that broader expense, we do uh, hire some security patrols and security for our campus uh, I, I, I need to knock on some wood, but we've been relatively lucky at our campus over the last year or so. We're not seeing the same kind of um, vandalism activity or criminal activity that we've been seeing during the height of the pandemic. But we do experience some vandalism, uh, not only at the pump stations, but at, at other parts of our uh, system as well. I know many other businesses in the floodplain are experiencing similar struggles. Any other questions this evening? We really appreciate your time and attention and the good questions. And if other things occur to you, you can always reach out to us. And uh, I would also just wanna reiterate my thanks to your board for their volunteer service. They're amazing and really provide a lot of great oversight and support to the staff. So thanks for the comments in the chat too, some interesting stuff. Jim or Wendy, I, I know there was at least one question uh, asking about what, to what degree is green infrastructure. Um, oh, I didn't see that one. Considered. Thank you, Bill. So let me uh, let me take a stab at that if if you if you, if you don't mind. Please. Um, the green infrastructure is being considered. Um, best way to describe. It. So it's con being considered. Uh, at kind of an as needed basis for, uh, currently with our current um, statute direction. Um, but with the new urban flood control district, uh, it will become much more part of our, our daily lives. Um, I would encourage folks who, uh, <laughs> when you think about green infrastructure and the levy, the diking districts, our, our drainage district, um, to broaden your, um, your definition of what green infrastructure is, if you're just focused on what it's, how it's used for, for instance, by the city of Portland's stormwater uh, manual or others similar to 
rain gardens or pervious pavements and so forth. Um, we will um, con be considering that and implementing those to the degree we can. Unfortunately, we uh, work in uh, uh, we work in a managed floodplain that where the groundwater level is super high, and so the ability to actually infiltrate water from the surface into the ground is very limited. Um, and so, but we'll, we'll in cases where that's maybe um, possible. Um, we'll certainly add that to our our pieces there, but um, concepts like green roofs are certainly things that I'm thinking about. Um, adding native vegetation to um, uh, our areas that we manage is something we're considering, um, but also other nature-based solutions such as possibly extending out the levee a little bit, so um, and then installing. Um, either some trees or um, some um, aquatic uh, habitat features like large woody debris or things that we're considering uh, as possibilities uh, that would be nature-based solutions for that help support uh, flood safety projects. We're also considering things um, like uh, purchasing land to um, create more flood storage um, and, um, and, and building uh, or enhancing a wetland wetland features in that area. Um, so that's on a, that's a possibility. So, um, but honestly, what we really need and what the new statute requires is for us to go through a watershed improvement planning process. And we'll be doing that over the first three years of our new district. And from that, uh, that should be able to give us some directions on uh, what things are, are, are probably most feasible uh, to apply a nature-based solution um, uh, for the types of flood safety projects that we want to engage in. So um, hopefully that answers the question um, and certainly welcome to circle back with us uh, after the meeting or another day to, if you want more details. Seeing no other obvious questions, just one last question. Uh really sincere appreciation to all of you for caring enough to show up and using your voice. Uh, this is what makes government work better. And we're really grateful for your time and attention and would hope that if you have concerns about our work or ideas for how we can improve that you will reach out to a board member or someone on the staff. And I know that there's been some chat about abandoned vehicles and so on. So again, please feel free to reach out if you see something that you think is impacting the uh, flood safety system and we'll do our best to uh, be as responsive as we can be or to work with our partners um, who own the underlying land to help us address any challenges that you identify. Appreciate the frustration around the houseless and the abandoned cars and the garbage. It's it's really hard for all of us and um, I guess the thing I would, would ask you to uh, recognize is that in the depths of the pandemic, it was hard for all the public sector agencies to really stay on top of that and I do see significant effort to try and dig our way back out, but it's gonna be a slow, challenging process. So your continued vigilance and voice will help ensure we stay focused on those important issues. Well, thanks everyone. If um, you don't have any other questions, we will adjourn the 2023 MCDD landowner meetings. Uh, please feel free to reach out to Myself or other staff, there's the info at mcdd.org email address, which is easy to remember if you have any follow-up questions. And we will have this recording available uh, in the next week or so um, if you'd like to review any of it. So thanks to all. Good night, everyone.